Before I continue with my video series on reclaiming the foodways of the United States, um, I wanted to touch on the idea like the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation like to call Great Britain and the United States these huge colonial powers, blah, blah, blah. We're so horrible because we did this and blah, blah, blah. We, we exploit, we exploit, we exploit. Uh, now, in my last video on this topic, uh, I covered how Russia, as the USSR, how USSR colonized, essentially, a lot of Latin American countries, uh, industrial colonization, and African countries, and Asian countries. China and North Korea could be seen as gigantic, well, China especially, as gigantic colonies of the USSR until China decided to break ranks with the USSR. So, uh, what, okay, blah, 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 okay. So, what the algorithm did not know, however, is that I am also an immigrant from Kazakhstan, okay, a Central Asian country that once was a part of the Soviet Union. As I continued scrolling through videos of young Western leftists on TikTok playing the soundtrack of the national anthem of the USSR and romanticizing Joseph Stalin, under whose regime millions of people were killed. Now, I myself believe Joseph Stalin was an excellent leader for the Soviet Union, okay? Um, I used to have this knee-jerk reaction to react to the word communism with disgust and horror, etc. And then I got into learning about communism. I don't have the same disgust. I, I wouldn't exactly say that, you know, the Soviet system was perfect, though nothing is. Um, it was far from the way people try to depict it, and some of the shortcomings are things like Soviet colonialism, okay? So, the, uh, so the Soviet Union, blah, 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 okay, national anthem of the USSR, okay, given the dire state of humanity today, aggravated by the pandemic and disaster capitalism, it's no, the disaster of capitalism, it's no wonder that the concept of communism continues to draw in new and especially young followers with its radical reimagination of the world order. Why wouldn't anyone want to foster transnational solidarity that overcomes racial, gender, and class boundaries? Yet by conflating the ideals of communism with the complexity of the Soviet Union, many risk adopting a myopic idealistic version of the USSR that disregards its own history of racism, orientalism, and colonial violence. Although the, although the Soviet Union was ideologically opposed to Western colonialism, ideologically opposed, might I add, okay, so it was ideologically opposed, uh, it, okay, it continued to uphold its own colonial practices, largely inherited and modified from Tsarist Russia. In particular, the story of discrimination faced by Central and North Asian indigenous populations goes mostly untold as a descendant of the blah, 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 okay. So the story of discrimination, okay, the history of the Soviet Union's rule in Central, A Central and North Asia, also known as Siberia, has roots in the imperial conquests of Tsarist Russia, with some of the earliest conquests dating back to the 16th century. Central Asian uh, Khanats, Khanates, empires, uh, were conquered by Russian emperors around the 17th century, and their borders were redrawn. Now, what needs to be understood here uh, we can't lose we can't lose sight of this either. These cagnates or cag these empires, uh, such as Khazaria is a big one, and some of these other ones. These uh, the Mongols that occupied some of these areas at one time ruled Russia. Okay, people know about the Mongol hordes, so you have to keep everything in context. The Mongols colonized. Europe, especially the, the parts of Europe that belong to Russia. So you do have to keep that in context, too. 
Okay, around the 17th century, and their borders were redrawn by the Soviets in the early 20th century to, to create the five countries that still exist today, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, what made these conquests different from the consolidation of Russian power in Eastern Europe was the superiority prism through which Asian groups were viewed. Despite its differences from Western empires, Tsarist Russia and later the Soviet Union followed the rite of passage of colonial domination by enforcing ideas of modernity and civilization onto savage nomadic tribes whose lands were labeled as virgin due to the lack of urbanization and agricultural development. After the establishment of the communist regime, the Soviet Union continued to exploit the lands of Russia's conquests in new ways, including for the construction of an image of Soviet inter-ethnic friendship of people as the pinnacle of communist progress. Some ethnic groups wanted uh, independence at the dawn of the so of Soviet rule, but were denied it. Okay, those Central Asian states were technically given more autonomy during the Soviet era than they were under the Russian Empire. Leaders of the USSR still ordered oppressive policies which harmed non-Slavic populations. Many Central Asian nations adopted Islam prior to their engulfment into the Soviet Union, forced unveiling of Muslim women in Uzbekistan. And this is what I have to point out here. You will notice there are similar values between Soviets and the, and the United States. Um, I like to point out that Iran, prior to the Islamic Revolution, looked very much like Afghanistan when Afghanistan was allied with the Soviet Union, meaning women had rights, uh, Islam was not enforced by law, and people could do essentially what they wanted within reason in both uh, Shah, the Shah's Syria and in uh, communist Afghanistan. So it may, so of course Syria at that time was al I'm not Syria. The Shah's Iran, sorry, the Shah's Iran, which was run by um, more or less the United States, the Shah in conjunction with the United States, uh, as said they had similar rights in uh, the Shah's Iran, as did the people of communist Afghanistan. So uh, the unveiling of women, I see as the um, the. Uh, enforcing of European ideals onto Islamic people. Now, is that wrong? Yes and no, maybe. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But the thing is, um, Islamists certainly enforce their views on the people that they've conquered as well. So in the name of so-called women's emancipation and destruction of madrasas across the region. So, of course, they're saying women's emancipation. Well, it kind of was. And the destruction of madrasas. Okay. In fear of Islam uniting different ethnic groups show how intrinsic parts of non-Slavic nations' identity were not only othered but made to conform the, the, uh, the echoing effects of these processes can be observed today, but this is what you have to understand. So the Russian Federation tries to state that what the U.S. did to Iraq was wrong, what the U.S. did in the Middle East was wrong, blah, 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 blah. Well, what the United States did in the Middle East, the USSR was doing uh, to their neighbors in Central Asia, North Asia, and Europe, Okay. So keep that in mind. Another example is the Russian language policy. In 1938, Russian became mandatory in all Soviet schools, empowered by the lack of literacy and abundance of resources directed at system, uh, systematizing the teaching of Russian. The Soviet authorities were able to successfully make Russian the official language spoken across Central Asia. Uh, this person was born in 1994, and his mother tongue is Russian, as it is his mother's tongue. Okay, <laughs> The colonial Soviet heritage 
he speaks so extensively about has always been felt in his interactions with his grandmothers, whose first language was Kazakh, and later in his own embarrassment for speaking the colonizer's tongue in his community in Kazakhstan. Okay, the Soviets also left horrendous environmental legacy. Now, this is true. Uh, Kazakhstan's wide step was used as the site for... See, this is the thing. There was a lot less respect for the environment in the Soviet Union than there was in the United States or any other Western nation. So Kazakhstan's wide step was used as a site for nuclear testing, uh, for a nuclear testing plant. The semi-whatever testing site played a paramount role in building the Soviet nuclear weapon arsenal during the Cold War. Okay... The abuse of power during the Soviet regime allowed for the local communist elites to flourish and seize power in, nine, in the 1990s, depriving newly independent Central Asian nations of even a chance at democratization. When, uh, when they struggle for their liberation today and ask the international community for attention and solidarity, the way many Kazakhstan, Kazakhstanis did... Uh, just le this January, during civil unrest that led to state violence and Russian military intervention, uh, their agency is undermined by the hegemonic in uh, imperial view of the region fostered by the Soviet Union and reproduced through the ignorance about its institutionalized violence. Uh, this person understands that the native romantic uh, romanticization or romanticization of the Soviet Union is a problem of education rather than a distinct political stance. Uh, he believes it's crucial to raise awareness about the historical issues central to the uh, indigenous Asian populations of the post-Soviet space, while Central and North Asian ethnic groups may differ in predominant attitudes towards the Soviet era, with some erring on the side of fondness, uh, we should encourage new generations learning about the Soviet Union to hold spaces for diverse and critical narratives. And that's what's important to understand. Like me, I used to have a knee-jerk reaction to anything Soviet or anything communist. I grew up as an anti-communist. My family were hardcore anti-communists. Uh, my father was a national socialist. My grandfather was a World War II veteran and a Korean War veteran. Uh, and you have to keep a critical, and I'm a pretty open-minded, pretty critically thinking person, uh, but even I would have that until I really took the time to really learn about communism as the policies of the USSR and other nations. Um, now, does this mean that I think communism is the greatest thing since sliced bread? Uh, maybe since sliced bread, but there are better things. Okay, and that's one of the reasons I tried to tout Roosevelt progressivism, which accomplished pretty much everything communism tried to accomplish, as well as everything fascism and national socialism tried to accomplish without sacrificing the liberties of the people. So let's move on here. What is Soviet imperialism characteristics? Although the Soviet Union was not ruled by an emperor and declared itself anti-imperialist and a people's democracy, it exhibited tendencies common to historic empires. The notion of the of Soviet empire often refers to a form of classic or colonial empire, with communism only replacing conventional imperial ideologies such as Christianity or monarchy. Rather, there's actually an excellent book written by the anti-communist Paul Blanchard, that I think people should read called The Communist Christ. Rather than creating a revolutionary state, academically the idea is seen as emerging with Richard Pipes, 1957 book, The Formation of the Soviet Union, Communism and Nationalism, 1917 to 1923, but it has been reinforced along with several other views and continuing scholarship. Several scholars hold that the Soviet Union was a hybrid entity containing elements common to both multinational empires and national states. The Soviet Union practiced colonialism similar to conventional imperial powers. The Soviets pursued internal colonialism in Central Asia. For example, the states prioritized grain production over livestock in Kyrgyzstan, which favored Slavic settlers over the, uh, the Kurdsgis, whatever, natives. 
uh, thus perpetuating the inequalities of the czarist colonial era, Maoists argued that the Soviet Union had itself become an imperialist power. So that's Maoists, which is humorous because now China has become an imperialist power. But Maoists argued that the Soviet Union had itself become an imperialist power while maintaining a socialist facade or social imperialism. Another dimension of Soviet imperialism is cultural imperialism, the Sovietization of culture and education at the expense of local traditions. Lenoid Brezhnev continued a policy of cultural Russification as part of developed socialism, which sought to assert more central control uh, Suvern Beiler argued that the Soviet state had an imperial nationalism. From the 1930s through the 1950s, Joseph Stalin ordered population transfers in the Soviet Union, deporting people, often entire nationalities, to underpopulated remote areas. The policy officially ended in the Khrushchev era, with many of the nationalities allowed to return in 1957. However, Nikita Khrushchev and uh, Leonid, uh, Leonid Brezhnev refused to the return the right of return for Crimean uh, Crimean Tatars, Russian Germans, and uh, Mesh whatever Turks. In 1991, the Supreme Soviet of Russia declared the Stalinist mass deportations to be a policy of defamation and genocide. The historical relationship between Russia, the dominant republic in the Soviet Union, and those and these Eastern European countries helps explain their longing to eradicate the remnants of Soviet culture. Poland and the Baltic states epitomize the Soviet attempt to build uniform cultures and political systems. According to Dagnorin, Russia was seeking to constitute and reinforce a buffer zone between itself and Western Europe so as to protect itself from potential future attacks from hostile Western European countries. The Soviet Union had lost 26 to 27 million lives over the course of the Second World War. To prevent a recurrence of such costly warfare, Soviet leaders believed that they needed to reestablish a hierarchy of political and economic dependence between neighboring states and the USSR. Now, what you'll notice, in the 1980s, when uh, the Soviets began exporting their oil to modern-day Europe, modern-day EU, um, the United States strongly encouraged them not to do that because it would make them dependent on Russia, and it did, okay? So during the Brezhnev era, the, so the, the goal of the Soviet Empire, and now the Russian Federation, is to make its allies dependents. During the Brezhnev era, the policy of, and actually in the case of the EU, the, the Russian Federation has done one better, actually, and made its enemies dependent upon it. So during the Brezhnev era, the policy of developed socialism declared the Soviet Union to be the most complete socialist country. Other countries were socialist, but the USSR was developed socialist, explaining its dominant role in hegemony over the other socialist countries. This and the interventionist Brezhnev doctrine permitting the invasion of other socialist countries led to the characterization of the USSR as an empire. Uh, Soviet influence in Soviet-leaning countries was mainly political and ideological rather than economically exploitative. The Soviet Union pumped enormous amounts of international assistance into them in order to secure influence. Ultimately, the determinant of its own economy, the detriment to the detriment of its own economy, what really broke the back of the Soviet Union was the war in Afghanistan trying to pump up a communist country, okay, uh, which failed. The Soviet Union, so a lot of people say that the United States won the Cold War. We did not win the Cold War so much as the Soviet Union lost. And this is where people th start thinking that the Soviet economic system doesn't work and all this bullshit. So the Soviet economic system works, okay. Supply-side economics works. Where it failed was utilizing money that should have been kept within the Soviet system 
and exporting that money to gain political influence. That's how the Soviet system failed. So the Russian Federation declared itself the successor state and recognized 103 billion of Soviet foreign debt while also claiming 140 billion of Soviet assets abroad. Economic expansion did, however, play a significant role in Soviet motivation to spread influence in its satellite territories. These new territories would ensure an increase in the global wealth which the Soviet Union would have a grasp on. Soviet officials from the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic inter, uh, inter, uh, inter, intertwined this economic opportunity with the potential of, for migration. In fact, they saw in these Eastern European countries the potential of, great, of a great workforce. They offered a welcome to them upon the only condition they work hard and achieve social success. This ideology was shaped on the model of meritocratic 19th century American foreign policy. So you see this was shaped on the same meritocracy that the United States incorporated into our thing, which brought in a bunch of European liberals and completely trashed our political system when they started uh, expressing themselves. <laughs> formal and informal empire. Scholars discussing Soviet empire have, have discussed it as a formal empire or informal empire. In a more formal interpretation of Soviet empire, this meant absolutism, resembling Lenin's description of the Tsarist Empire as a prison of people, except that this prison of the people had been actualized during the Stalin regime after, St after Lenin's death. Another view, especially of the non-Stalinist errors, sees the Soviet Empire as constituting an informal empire over nominally sovereign states in the Warsaw Pact, Due to the Soviet pressure and military presence, the Soviet informal empire depended on subsidi uh, subsidies from Moscow. The informal empire in the wider Warsaw Pact also included linkages between communist parties. Some historians consider a more multinational-oriented Soviet Union, emphasizing its socialist initiatives, such as Ian Bremmer, who describes a... Uh, Martyrs, whatever nationalism, where a pan Soviet nationalism included other nationalisms. Uh, Eric Hobsenbaum argued the, that the Soviet Union had effectively designed nations by drawing borders. Dmitry Trenin wrote that by the 1980s, the Soviet Union had formed both a formal and informal empire. The informal empire would have included Soviet economic investments, military occupation, and covert action in Soviet-aligned countries. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Allies of the Soviet Union... A Warsaw Pact, of course, the People's Socialist Republic of Albania, People's Republic of Bulgaria, Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, German Democratic Republic, Hungarian People's Republic, Polish People's Republic, uh, and Socialist Republic of Romania. Okay, this is the... Uh, the Soviet Union had two of its Union Republics in the United Nations General Assembly, which is the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic and the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Other Marxist-Leninist states uh, allies with the Soviet Union, Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, People's Republic of Angola, People's Republic... These are, you can envision these as colonies. You know how the British government had colonies like India, envision these the same as colonies. The Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, or the People's Republic of Angola, People's Republic of Benin, Chinese Soviet Republic. That's very important because, as I stated, that is by far the largest, large, well, the People's Republic of China, the largest colony of the Soviet Union. People's Republic of, until they broke rank, People's Republic of Congo, Republic of Cuba, Provisional Military Government of Socialist Ethiopia, uh, People's Republic of Kampuchea, People's uh, Revolutionary Government of Grenada, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the Lao People's Democratic Republic, 
Democratic Republic of Madagascar, Mongolian People's Republic, People's Republic of Mozambique, Somali Democratic Republic, Tuvan uh, People's Republic, Democratic Republic of Vietnam, Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Okay, well, then it was the Socialist Republic. Okay, Federal People's Republic of Yugoslavia, People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. Okay. Sometimes their support, okay, so some countries in the third world had pro-Soviet governments during the Cold War in the political terminology of the Soviet Union. These were countries moving along the socialist road of development, okay? So as opposed to more advanced countries of developed, uh, developed socialism, which were mostly located in Eastern Europe, but that also included Cuba and Vietnam, they received some aid, either military or economic, from the Soviet Union and were influenced by it to varying degrees. Sometimes their, super, their support for the Soviet Union eventually stopped for various reasons, and in some cases the pro-Soviet government lost power, while in other cases the same government remained in power but ultimately ended its alliance with the Soviet Union. These include Algeria, the People's Republic of Bangladesh, Burkina Faso, Burma, Cape Verde, Chile, Egypt, Ghana, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Equilateral uh, Guinea, India, Indonesia, Iraq, Jamaica, Libya, Mali, Nicaragua, Peru, Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, Sao Tome and Principal, uh, the Sanchiles, Sudan, Syria, Tanzania, Second East Turkestan Republic, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Marxist-Leninist Marxist states opposed to the Soviet Union. This is important to understand. Albania, not all Marxist-Leninist states agreed with the Soviet Union. So Albania, Cambodia, China, Romania, Somalia, Yugoslavia. Neutral states. This is where the term third world comes in. So some neutral states include... Okay, let's see. The position of Finland was complex. The Soviet Union invaded Finland in the Winter War and lost, which ended in 1940. Moscow Peace Treaty and the Continuation War of Finland, together with Nazi Germany, subsequently renewed hostilities in 1941. The war ended in Soviet victory, but Finland retained most of its territory and its market economy, trading on the Western markets and ultimately joining the Western currency system. Nevertheless, although Finland was considered neutral, the Finno-Soviet Treaty of 1948 significantly limited Finnish freedom of operation in foreign policy. It required Finland to defend the Soviet Union from attacks through its territory, which in practice prevented Finland from joining NATO and effectively gave the Soviet Union a veto in Finnish foreign policy. Thus, the Soviet Union could exercise imperial hegemonic power even towards a neutral state. Under the da, Finland, da, da, da. post Soviet era reactions. Da, da, da. I'm going to move on now. So, one of the biggest myths about Russia is that it did not colonize anyone, that it liberated them. So, let's take a look at this. Uh, so, Vladimir Putin delivered a speech justifying what was to come. Modern Ukraine was entirely and fully created by Russia, more specifically the Bolshevik communist Russia. He said on February 21, it was familiar. So he's saying it was the Bolshevik communist Russia uh, created what was Ukraine. He said on February 21st, it was, fam it was familiar language to those who have been listening to Putin's laments over the end of the Soviet Union since the rise since his rise to power in 1999, it was familiar and worrying language to the states of Central Asia, too, which have heard the same claims directed f uh, their way. In essence, it was language of a colonizer about the colonized. Uh, in an April article uh, for po uh, Ponar's Eurasia, uh, scholars, blah, 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 uh, wrote that it was time to question Russia's imperial innocence. The Kremlin's propaganda builds on seeing Russia as both victimized, 
by the West and entitled to regional dominance in the former Soviet territories. They wrote, in such Russian imperial imagination enforcing the Russian language, culture, and rule on non-Russian populations is not colonialism but a gift of greatness. It's time they argued to strip away that fantasy and see the past for what it truly was. Okay, in an April article in Point of Data, you write the Data. Okay. I'm gonna move on. You can you can definitely read this on your own. It's kind of repeating some of the stuff I've already covered. <clears throat> so what was Soviet industrial colonization? Well, the political and cultural Soviet imperial legacy is an urgent uh, is an urgent need for Ukraine for a long time as as desire for linguistic, religious, and toponymic liberation was blocked by economic dependence on the metropolis. For centuries after whatever, in 1654, Ukraine gradually lost not only political power but also economic independence due to Moscow's restrictions on business and trade. Redirection of customs, yada yada. The Tsar heritage, modernizing Ukrainian industry from the mid-19th century. Okay to early 20th century was also aimed at ensuring the development of all Russian domestic market and increasing the empire's exports in order to strengthen the economy and ensure its technical and structural modernization as well as the growth of new promising industries. The Russian government stimulated foreign investments to develop natural deposits and construct new enterprises on the territory of Ukrainian government, uh, governorates. As a result, the metallurgical and coal industry and a number of powerful machine-building enterprises were established in the southeast of Ukraine on the eve of World War I. This region's enterprises region was producing 78% of the entire empire's coal, 75% of its iron ore, 69% of its cast iron, 67% of its sponge iron, 56% of its steel, 58% of its rolled steel, and 26% of its electricity. Thus, these enterprises were the driver of the empire's industrial progress. So Ukraine, through the colonization and modernization, forced modernization by Russia, by Tsarist Russia, is what propelled the Russian Empire into modernity. At the start of the 20th century, Ukraine was one of the largest producers and exporters of sugar, food, and fodder, and fodder grains, hence significantly filling the imperial treasury. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, a railway network was built on Ukrainian territory to supply grain, coal, sugar, and iron ore to the empire's other economic regions to export Ukrainian bread to the Black Sea, Azov, and Baltic ports, and for the military and strategic interests of the Russian Empire. According to the famous Ukrainian economist of the 1930s, Mikhailo Volo whatever, uh, from, from 1893 to 1910, Russia received almost 3.3 billion rubles, or rubles from Ukraine while spending 2.6 billion rubles on Ukraine's needs. So it was a profit. You, you dig? That was a profit to them. Thus, it used one-fifth of the income received from the imperial army and developing the Russian economy. Therefore, although Ukraine was one of the most developed regions of the Russian Empire, its colonial status was determined by developing industry, industry and transportation infrastructure, primarily in the interests of the imperial government. Ukraine is a jumping-off point for the socialist leap. The Bolsheviks announced a course of industrialization, which aimed not not just to strengthen the country's industrial potential and the conditions of economic autark uh, autarky and opposition to the capitalist government environment. Moreover, Marx's dream of a world revolution and forming a world union of proletarian republics were raised to the rank of state ideology okay, and foreign policy in the Soviet and Soviet Russia. At the Fifth Congress of the whatever blah blah blah, uh, we will have to conquer five-sixths of the Earth's land surface so that there is a union of Soviet socialist republics all over the world, establishing the USSR. In 1922, that was stated. As the industrialization plan started to be implemented, all heavy industry enterprises were subordinated to the all-union governing bodies, people's uh, commissars, in, in fact, this meant that not only establishing the Stalinist view of economic management, 
involving vol uh, voluntarism in, in identifying priorities and rates of economic development, directive planning and command and administration methods of management, but also strict centralization when the construction and production, all economic capacities and natural resources of Ukraine were managed from outside its borders from the Union Center. During the development and consideration of the first five-year plans for developing the national economy, Ukrainian scientists and employees of the State Planning Committee of the Ukrainian S Soviet Socialist Republic. So keep in mind, this is showing that Ukraine was colonized by the Soviet Union, argued for balanced development of the Ukrainian economy, criticized excessively financial centralism, and justified resource and financial autonomy. So. This was not a Soviet, a Soviet Republic. This was a country colonized by the Soviet Union. However, the Union State Planning Committee suggested parameters and a type of Ukrainian industry development that turned it into a raw material and energy basis for industrializing all Union republics, primarily the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. So during the 1920s, Ukrainian exports also faced changes in 1927 to 1928. About 89% of Ukrainian products, included bread, were exported to Russian regions, while other countries accounted for only 11% of exports. Do, do, do. New constructions of all union importance. The Soviet leadership was preparing for war with global imperialism. Hence, it strived to quickly create its own powerful industrial base, able, according to uh, Valerian, whatever, to swiftly switch from peacefully building socialism to repelling the capitalist world. Due to the need to manufacture a lar large volumes of industrial products and the lack of qualified personnel and modern industrial equipment, numerous giant factories were constructed. That's the name of many of these plants. The policy of leveling sister republics and strengthening the family of fraternal nations. In the mid-1930s, development of the Eastern Union republics began to gradually intensify due to Soviet military strategies and authorities' unwillingness to allow self-sufficient development of Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic economy. This policy of economic zoning and spatial levying was mostly developed by the heads of the Council for the Study of Productive Forces of the USSR and the State Planning Committee. World War II significantly accelerated implementation of the initial of the initiated processes. Due to the German troop offensive in Ukraine during July, Octo July to October 1941, the Soviet authorities carried out a large-scale evacuation of industrial ex uh, enterprises and factory equipment to the east, in particular to uh, Mag whatever course. Okay. Okay. The number of sisters increased. The post-war recovery of Ukrainian economy mainly involved the investments to enhance the work of, exp of enterprises whose products were now to be exported to member states of the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, formed in 1949 to compete with the member states of the then European Economic Community. Exports were completely controlled by the USSR's Ministry of Foreign Trade and focused on achieving the political and strategic interests of the Union State, which clearly defined the vector and nomenclature of the products. Ties that turned in chains. Okay, since the collapse of the Soviet Union gaining independence, Ukraine has been reaping the fruits of the centrally planned integration into a single national economic complex for 30 years. The following features of the Soviet economic policy towards Ukraine prove that, it's, that this integration was colonial. Deprivation of subjectivity in economic decision-making. Use of natural resources in production and human potential in metropolis interests. Building dependence via the inclusion into a network. Deprivation of perspectives. So as noted, the, uh, the Russian Federation likes to have this idea that somehow the only people that were interested in uh, freeing the Slavic people from the USSR and joining with the fascists were the Ukrainians. Well, this is the Russian fascist organization, all Russian fascist organization. Okay.
And this can be learned about on your own. You can follow these, which later became the Russian Fascist Party. Okay. Russian fascism united with the with Chinese nationalism. This is the governing ideology of Taiwan at the moment. What about structural violence against indigenous peoples in the Russian Federation? I've already covered some of this in the beginning of this video. Feel free to check it out on your own. Okay. What about the oppression of Russia's indigenous people? Yes, that was a thing. That was a thing done by the czars and done by the Soviet Union. So what kind of racism took place in the Soviet Union? Well, Soviet leaders and authorities officially condemned nationalism and proclaimed internationalism, including the right of nations and peoples to self-determination. While the Soviet Union did not practice racial politics, quote, racial politics, and was supportive of self-determination and rights of many minorities and colonized people, it significantly marginalized people of certain ethnic groups designated as enemies of the people. Okay. So, and promoted chauvinistic, Russian, nationalistic, and settler colonist activities in their lands. So, Koreans, okay, deportation of Koreans in the Soviet Union, originally conceived in 1926, initiated in 1930, and carried through 1937, was, for the, was the first mass transfer of an entire nationality in the Soviet Union. Almost the entire Soviet population of ethnic Koreans, 171,781 uh, persons, were forcefully moved from the Russian Far East to unpopulated, area, po unpopulated areas of the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic and the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic in October 1937. Chinese the Soviet regime performed mass arrests and deportations of people on people of Chinese descent. By the 1930s, about 24,600 Chinese lived in the Russian Far East and were targeted by Soviet policies that became increasingly uh, repressive against diaspora nationalities, leading to the deportation and exile a major Chinese of a major Chinese community in the Soviet Union. The deportation of 1943, can, uh, code named Operation Whatever, uh, were the deported was the deportation of most people of Kalmyk nationality in the Soviet Union, uh, and Russian women married Kalmyks, except Kalmyk women married to another nationality. Okay. Eastern Europeans, the forcible deportation of Crimean Tatars uh, from Crimea. Crimea. Okay, so remember that Crimea is a Tatar region. Okay, it's not a Slavic region. It's not Ukrainian, nor is it Russian. It's a Tatar region uh, for alleged collaboration with Nazi occupation regime. In da -da -da, okay, Cossacks, the Soviet Union enacted a campaign of de Cossackification. Does that sound similar to denazification to end the existence of the Cossacks? The Poles, after the Polish-Soviet War, uh, theater of the Russian Civil War, Poles were often persecuted by the Soviet Union. Uh, this is the NKVD national operations. Other ethnic mass deportations performed by the NKVD include the Greek operation, German operation, Latvian operation, Korean operation, Estonian operation, and others. Transcaucasians, the Nak people, two ethnic groups that were uh, specifically targeted for persecution in the Stalin era were the Chechens and the Ingush. Uh, Soviet media accused the two ethnic groups of having cultures which did not fit the so with the Soviet culture, such as accusing Chechens of being associated with banditism. And authorities claimed that the Soviet Union had to intervene in order to remake and reform these cultures. Uh, Mesh Meshetian Turks are a Turkic people who originated originally inhabited Georgia before their internal exile by the Soviet Union during the deportation of 90,000 Meshetian Turks were forcibly exiled to the Uzbek Socialist Republic, Soviet Socialist Republic, Armenians and Az Azerbaijanis, Armenian refugees were who survived the Armenian genocide in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, developed cultural and linguistic continu uh, continuities. 
blah, blah, blah. Okay. Jews, of course. Uh, abol okay, after the October Revolution, Lenin and the Bolsheviks abolished the laws which regarded the Jews as an outlawed people. Whilst the Bolsheviks were opposed to all religion, Christianity, as well as Judaism, Stalin emerged as a leader of the Soviet Union following the power struggle with Leon Trotsky. After the death of Lenin, Stalin had been accused of resorting to, quote, anti-Semitism. Africans. In December 1963, students from Ghana and other African countries protested at Red Square in Moscow following the alleged murder of Ghanaian medical student Edmund Azari Otto, who had been courting a Russian girl prior to his body being discovered along a country road. The protesters carried placards with slogans, Moscow Center for Discrimination, Stop Killing Africans, and Moscow a Second Alabama. While shouting in English, Russian, and French, they marched to the uh, Spassky gates of the Kremlin, where they posed for photographs and gave interviews to Western journalists. So this is an examination of colonization of the by the Soviet Union. Okay, and I'm going to call this quits. Uh, people can follow these links when they feel like it. And that's all for this video.